Hello friends, this is Fiction Domain. How are you all? So we are back with an interesting movie on what if Naruto was the White Fire Prince. Naruto is adopted and by Iro. Naruto and Avatar The Last Airbender Crossover. The summary says. What if after abandoning his siege and returning home Iroh's fleet was caught in a storm and ended up in the elemental nations. There Iroh meets Naruto and after learning of his hard life, decides to adopt him as his son and take him to the Fire Nation. But before we start, if you want more stuff like this. Then be sure to subscribe and like this video. And if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. Currently sailing from the eastern coast of the Earth Kingdom and in the middle of the sea between the Western Air Temple and the North Pole, a massive fleet of over 100 metal warships sailed, led by a massive Empire-class battleship. This fleet was being led by the Fire Nation's greatest general, General Iroh, also known as the Dragon of the West, son of the Fire Lord Azalon, and Crown Prince of the Fire Nation, next in line for the throne. Iroh was currently returning home with his army after his failed attempt to conquer Ba Sing Si. Iroh had laid siege to the city for 600 days and successfully breached the outer wall, a feat that had never been equaled before since the war began. However, before he could breach the inner wall, his only son Lu Ten was killed on the front lines, and in his grief Iroh abandoned the siege and decided to return home with his army. Iroh was currently on the catwalk of the bridge of his ship looking out into the open sea, thinking about his now dead son. Soon after Iroh called for the captain of his ship, saying, Captain, I want you to signal the rest of the fleet and tell them that we're to head west instead of south. But sir, why? Asked the captain. There is a large storm coming, I can smell it in the air and tell by the way the seagulls are flying, Iroh answered. But sir, are you sure? There's not a cloud in the sky, the weather is perfect, and if we do this, it will delay our return to the Fire Nation by several weeks, if not more, objected the captain. Trust me captain, I'm sure, so please signal the fleet, as I'm sure the men would rather delay returning home by a few weeks, rather than never returning at all, Iroh replied. Very well sir, I will signal the ships and have the fleet turn west the captain acquiesced. Thank you captain, replied Iroh, whereupon the captain saluted and went back inside to the bridge, while Iroh continued to stare out into the horizon. Unfortunately, even though the fleet made the alterations as Iroh had ordered and headed west, the storm was much larger than they had expected, and they were still caught by it. Fortunately though, thanks to Iroh's leadership, the fleet was able to stay together, and though they did suffer some damage and lose a few men, the majority were able to continue. However, a few ships did sustain some heavy engine damage, while others lost valuable rations. In addition, the fleet found that they had been blown far northwest and found themselves too far away from their land to continue without docking somewhere else first. Once all the damage was assessed, Iroh decided to try and find somewhere they could make repairs and find fresh water and supplies to restock their ships. After nearly a week of sailing and seeing no sign of land, the fleet, along with everyone in it, were beginning to lose hope that they would find land and were starting to think that they would never return home to their families. But just when all hope was lost, a large landmass was spotted and soon after they found a city with a large where they could make repairs and stock up on supplies. Naturally when the people of the city saw the massive fleet of unknown metal warships, many people got scared, believing that some foreign nation had come to conquer them. Knowing what would happen, Iroh came ashore in a small boat with along with a small escort. Iroh then met with the lord of the city, where Iroh explained his fleet situation, assuring the lord that neither he nor his fleet had any intention of invading his city or their country. The lord of course remained skeptical of Iroh's story, believing that it could be some kind of trick to have them lower their guard so that Iroh and his forces could conquer the city with little trouble. But eventually, they came to an agreement where the majority of Iroh's fleet would remain out in open sea, and only three ships at a time were allowed to the docks to make repairs. The crews of the ships would remain on board their ships under heavy guard. However, small groups of unarmed crewmen and soldiers would be allowed to enter and roam the city for shore leave, as long as they caused no trouble. Supplies of food and water would be sent to the ships, although Iroh and his fleet would have to pay for all of them, along with the things they needed to make the repairs on the ships. Fortunately though, Iroh had plenty of gold on board the fleet, so payment was not a major issue, although the arrangement would prolong the amount of time they had to spend away from home. In Kanoha a few days later, currently running through the streets, an eight-year-old Naruto, wearing black short sandals and a white shirt with spirals on it, was running through the streets trying to hide from a mob of angry villagers. Every week, Naruto would be chased by a gang of angry people, all yelling die demon. Or, kill the demon spawn. Along with other things. When this happened one of three things would happen. They would corner him and beat him up, he would find a place to hide from them, or some masked ninjas called Anbu would come and knock the people out and take them away, bringing him back to his small apartment and then leaving. As he ran, he quickly turned into an alleyway with a wooden fence at the end of it, where he saw a small hole in the fence that was just big enough for him to fit into. 
Moving quickly, he ran to the fence wall and squeezed himself through the hole. After he was clear of the hole, he quickly found a brown box, which he put in front of his end of the portal, in order to provide some camouflage. As soon as he did this, Naruto heard the voices of the people chasing him from behind the fence. Where did the demon brat go? Said one man. I don't know. I was sure I saw him turn into this alley, another man said. Well, he clearly not here, as the only things I can see are some old wooden boxes, and they're too small for him to hide in, said a woman. Well he couldn't have gotten far, let's find him, yet another man said, after which Naruto heard them running off in a different direction. When the gang of people left, Naruto sighed and fell against the wooden fence. This time, he had escaped another beating, but he could not help but wonder if he would the next time or the time after that. Every week since he was five, people have been attacking him, calling him all kinds of names, insulting him, and beat him. What got Naruto most upset, however, were the angry stares the people would give him, as well as how they would ignore him as if he didn't exist, which was the worst of all. Why do they hate me? Why do they call me demon? What did I ever do to have them so angry at me? Thought Naruto as he sat on the ground. The only person that had ever shown him any real kindness was the Hokage who was in a way like a grandfather to him. When he asked the Hokage why the people hated him so much, he would always change the subject or not answer at all. The same thing would happen when he asked if he knew anything about his parents. Naruto was even more down today, as he had failed to pass the graduation exam to become a genin. He had hoped that if he could become a shinobi, he could train and become the Hokage, so that people would stop hating him and treat him with respect, as he believed that it was the only way that people would acknowledge him. Now though, he was beginning to wonder if that would ever happen, as even if he became a ninja for the village, would they ever accept him and let him be Hokage, not to mention how many more beatings would he have to go through before they stopped. At this, he began to become more and more upset, as he believed that Kanoha would never accept him. It was then that Naruto decided that if he wanted any kind of life for himself, he would have to leave Kanoha. He was through with being the village's punching bag, damn it. Quickly going back to his small rundown apartment, Naruto gathered his few belongings and some food and things, before he the packed them up in his backpack. He then snuck out the village through a small hole in the village wall that he had found by accident when hiding one day. After walking for a while, Naruto decided to have one last look at Kanoha from the hillside he was on. After a few minutes of just looking, Naruto could not help but feel slightly saddened, as even though he suffered much hardship in Kanoha, it was still the only home he had ever known. Eventually, Naruto pushed that feeling aside and started to walk away, not knowing if he would ever see Kanoha again. One week later in the Hokage's office, currently sitting at his desk was the Hokage, holding a file on Naruto, with a small photo of him in the top left-hand corner. It had been a full week since Naruto had disappeared from the village, and there had still been no trace of him yet. Naruto's disappearance had only been discovered about two days after he had left, when the Hokage had decided to check on Naruto through his mystical crystal ball. He could find no trace of him inside or anywhere near the village. Immediately, the Hokage called for every available shinobi he had and had them search for Naruto, unfortunately they could not find him, and his apartment looked like it had not been used in several days. Also, there had been heavy rain the following day after Naruto left, thereby erasing any tracks that Naruto may have left for the Inuzuka clan members to track him with. They had no idea where Naruto went and what direction he took, when the council heard this, the civilian members seemed happy and even suggested that they celebrate. Saratobi, stating that if there was any kind of celebration in the village, then said people would find themselves spending the next three months in an underground 8x10 holding cell, quickly put that down. The elders though, were greatly concerned that Naruto may have been somehow taken by one of the other shinobi villages, in the hopes of weakening Kanoha, while strengthening themselves at the same time. Saratobi quickly stated that Naruto was not kidnapped, as Kanoha's barrier team had stated that no intruders had entered the village, leaving the idea that he had simply left the village as the only plausible explanation. This of course made the elders very concerned, since the idea of the Jinchikriki of the Kikbi no Imko, roaming outside the village, did not sit well with them. Especially since there was a good chance he may be discovered by another village and turned against them. Naruto my boy, where are you? Saratobi thought as he looked sadly at the picture in the file of a young smiling Naruto. Soon after, the Hokage laid the file back on the table and looked sadly at the photo of his former successor, the Yandame Hokage, Naruto's father on his wall with the other Hokages. Curse people's blind anger and hatred, Naruto no doubt left due to the people persecuting him so much, something no child should go through I'm sorry Minato. I should have done more to protect your son, and because I did not he has run away from here, you and Kishina must be turning in your graves for what the village has done to him. As the Hokage continued to mope over his failings to protect Naruto better, a sudden puff was heard. Where when the old Hokage looked up he saw Naruto's father last remaining student, had a Kakashi appear in front of him. When Naruto's disappearance was first reported, Kakashi had been one of the first to volunteer to go looking for him, as he felt responsible for not looking after his sensei's son. 
He had thought that his assignment in the Anbu Black Ops Division would make him a poor role model and caretaker and had recently resigned, hoping to be able to make things right for the unfortunate child. Bakashi, have you anything to report on Naruto's whereabouts? Saratobi asked, hoping for some news about Naruto. I Hokage-sama, I do, replied Kakashi, although I was not able to find Naruto, I believe I have found where he might be. Where? As I was searching for any sign of Naruto, I met a traveling merchant on the road, not too far from the village. I had asked him if he had seen a blonde hair boy on his way here and then showed him a picture of Naruto. He said he had and told me that a few days ago he remembered seeing Naruto. He remembered Naruto because he noticed that Naruto was alone and thought it strange for a boy his age was traveling by himself. Where was Naruto headed? Asked the Hokage urgently. According to the merchant, he had seen Naruto on the road, not far from the port city Gifu, where he seemed to be heading to, answered Kakashi. Upon hearing this, the Hokage quickly ordered Kakashi to gather team compass of whoever he wanted and have them leave in the next hour to head to Gifu and find Naruto. Nodding, Kakashi quickly shunshined, body flicker, away. Please be safe Naruto Saratobi thought as he turned around in his chair and looked out the window over the village. The Gifu port city, currently walking through the streets, Iroh was taking in the sights of the city, the last few days here had been very interesting for him. During his time in the city, Iroh bought several items, such as books and maps about the continent. He found it very funny, if not ironic, when he learned that the country he was in was called Fire Country. In addition, he wondered about the nearby tea country, wishing that he had the time to visit and try some of the country's namesake. He also found it fascinating how very different this land was from the Fire Nation and the other four great nations. In this land they had people called shinobi, who were skilled in the art of assassination and could do many different and wondrous things, like change into different things and make copies of themselves. He also learned that they could do things that they called jutsus which resembled bending, but they did not bend the actual elements, instead they used an energy called chakra to mimic bending. But still, from what he read about it all, it was still quite powerful, and what was even more interesting was that unlike four great nations, these shinobi could learn to use more than one element, whether it was through training or natural ability. He even learned that these shinobi in a way had their own countries inside the official countries of the ones they lived in. This was shown by how they had their own land, laws, traditions, and ruled themselves by electing their own leaders. Although these leaders still answered to the lords of the countries they lived in, who were called daimyos and were expected to serve them during times of war. It was all very fascinating, but what Iroh found most fascinating was the genetic traits called bloodlines, which were the abilities passed down genetically in specific clans. As only people from these select families could manifest their ability, this resulted in highly specialized techniques and styles, each unique to the originators. As Iroh was walking down the street, he saw a small playground where he saw a young boy, no more than seven or eight, and a young girl, slightly younger, clearly the boy's sister playing tag with their father. Upon seeing this, a sad look spread across Iroh's face as it brought back memories of when he played with his own son Lu Tin, when he that age. As he watched them, he suddenly felt someone pulling on his money purse on the side of his belt. Quickly turning around, he saw that it was a young boy with spiky, bright blonde hair, wearing a dirty white t-shirt with a spiral on it, along with tattered black shorts and broken sandals. Curiously enough, the child looked like he had whisker marks on his face. Upon seeing that he was caught, the boy started to run down the street, causing Iroh to give chase. But Naruto, when Naruto left Konoha, he traveled and followed the roads that people would travel to and from Konoha, as he did not know which way to go. For several days he kept follow the roads until he came to the shore and saw the wide open sea. He could not help but be in awe at the vastness of the sea, as this was the first time he had ever seen it. He had followed the signposts that lead him to the port city of Gifu, where he had hoped he could buy some food and maybe find a job to earn some money for a place to stay, and then he could then decide what to do next. But when he got to Gifu, he was attacked by some older kids who took all his money and most of his things, and he couldn't find a place to stay or any place where he could earn some money. This left him with nothing, leaving no choice but to sleep in a rundown abandoned building. After a few more days with no food, Naruto decided that stealing was his only option if he wanted to survive. Using some of the skills he gained from his time in the academy, Naruto was able to steal some fruits and things, he didn't like stealing, but he had no other choice if he wanted to survive. During his time in Gifu, Naruto saw the massive metal ships being repaired in the docks that belonged to the foreigners that arrived recently from a country that was funny enough called the Fire Nation. He even saw from the distance the rest of the fleet and could only image what it would be like to command a massive fleet of ships like that. He even noticed some of the men that came from the ships and admired the cool red uniforms that they wore, as well as the creepy armor that some of the others wore. As he was looking at them, he noticed an older man wearing a darker type of armor than any of the other foreign men. Naruto guessed that he must be some kind of commander. 
As he looked at the man he also saw a large money purse on his belt, Naruto had heard from some of the people in the city that the foreign men were quite wealthy as they had plenty of gold on them. Upon seeing the money purse, Naruto decided to try and take it, he didn't want to, but it was either steal or starve, hence he started to follow the man, but kept a good distance from him. Eventually Naruto saw him stop to watch some kids playing with their father and saw a sad look appear on his face. When Naruto saw them, the same kind of look appeared on his face as well, along with a slightly envious look, as he had often longed to have something like that. To have a family who loves you and be there to support you and care for you would truly have been one of the most treasured things he could ever have. Quickly pushing those thoughts aside, Naruto slowly and carefully snuck up on the man, where once he came behind, Naruto started to slowly undo the man's purse, and just as he was slowly pulling it off, the man suddenly turned around and saw him. Seeing that he was caught Naruto quickly ran off, fearing that he would be punished severely for it, as he ran he looked behind him and saw that the same man was now chasing after him, telling to him to stop and wait. Naruto continued to run for a few minutes until he turned into a corner and ran into two Fire Nation soldiers who were just returning from their shore leave. Ouch. Hey watch it kid. Exclaimed one of the soldiers when Naruto crashed into him and he caught hold of Naruto. Let me go let me go I didn't do anything. Naruto cried as he tried to get the soldier to let him go and get away before Iroh caught up with him. But just as the soldier was about to let him go, Iroh came around the corner panting heavily, stop. Pant do not let pant, pant him go said the out-of-breath general. Quickly both Sodders grabbed a better hold of the now struggling Naruto, who was pleading them to let him go as the dragon of the west caught his breath. General Iroh sir, did something happen between you and this boy? One of the soldiers asked, whereupon hearing this, Naruto stopped struggling. He's a general he thought in surprise, as he then started to get worried as he didn't think that Iroh was that important, he knew he was someone of importance, but not by that much, hence he knew he was in a lot of trouble. Ah, yes it seems this young man decided to try and borrow some money from me without asking first, Iroh said in a pleasant voice, as if there was nothing wrong with what Naruto tried to do. He tried to steal from you sir? One of the Sodders asked, turning an angry frown on Naruto. Do you wish us to bring him to the authorities here and hand him to them sir? The other soldier asked. Now, now gentlemen I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation to his actions, spoke Iroh as he knelt down and told the men to let Naruto go. Once they let go of Naruto, Iroh spoke to Naruto, now then young man, why don't you tell us your name? At first Naruto said nothing as as he wasn't sure if he should answer and thought he should run. But he decided against it as he knew that they would just start chasing him again and no doubt attract the attention of more of the foreign people and they would capture him again. So he decided to answer the man's questions, whereupon they hopefully would let him go. My name is Uzumaki Naruto. Well then Naruto, my name is Iroh, it's very nice to meet you, Iroh said as he then held out his hand to shake hands, where Naruto hesitantly reciprocated. Now then Naruto, why don't you tell me why were you trying to steal my money, surely you know that stealing is wrong, Iroh said kindly. I know, but I had no choice, I was hungry, and I had no money to buy any food, I didn't want to, but I had to, Naruto replied sorrowfully, as he really didn't like stealing, he was just left with no other choice. If you were hungry, then why did you not go home, surely your parents would give you something to eat, Iroh replied, although he immediately regretted it when he saw the look on Naruto's face. I don't have any parents, they died when I was born, or at least that was what I was told, Naruto replied. When Iroh saw this, a sad look appeared on his face, realizing that Naruto was an orphan. Iroh had seen more than his fair share of orphans during the war, many of which he made as his army fought the Earth Kingdom. I'm very sorry to hear that Naruto, but do you not have anyone to care for you or a home to stay? Iroh asked. No, not really, I live by myself for as long as I can remember in a small old apartment, and the only person who really tried to take care of me was the Hokage. Everyone else there hates me and calls me names as well as beat me up, which was why I ran away from there. Upon hearing still and Iroh could not help but pity Naruto and understood why he ran away from that place. Naruto, spoke Iroh, gaining the boy's attention, what would you say about coming to my ship and having lunch there? At this a happy look appeared on Naruto's face at seeing one of the ships up close, really. Where Iroh nodded. Soon after, Iroh led Naruto to the docks, where they went on a small boat that brought them to Iroh's command ship. When Naruto saw the ship, he could not help but be in awe of the ship's size and grandeur. You command this? Asked Naruto in awe. Yes I do, although I must say it's rather hard to clean it, said Iroh with a small chuckle at his little joke, as Naruto just smiled. Soon enough, they boarded the ships, and Iroh asked the men that greeted them to have the cook prepare a meal for him and Naruto, and to have it set on the deck outside, saying that it was a nice day for a meal outside. The men nodded and went off, after which Iroh asked Naruto if he would like a tour of the ship while they waited for their meal to be cooked. Naruto of course eagerly agreed, as he was anxious to see more of the ship. 
For the next hour and a half, Iroh showed Naruto around the ship, showing him things like the crew quarters, engine room, the bridge, the mess room, and other parts of the ship. Naruto, of course, was ecstatic about seeing the ship and often asked Iroh different questions about the ship, which Iroh was more than happy to answer as he enjoyed Naruto's enthusiasm. Once the tour was done, Iroh and Naruto went to have lunch at the deck, where a medium-sized table was placed and laid with food. Once they sat down, Naruto immediately started to eat hungrily, seeing this Iroh could not help but look sadly at Naruto, as it showed that he hadn't eaten a good meal in some time. When Naruto saw Iroh looking at him he stopped eating and looked both embarrassed and ashamed, thinking that Iroh must be disgusted by his lack of manners. However, Iroh quickly assured Naruto that it was alright and to go ahead and eat and even called one of the men who brought the food to bring more food. As Naruto ate, Iroh could not help but admire the amount that Naruto ate. Soon after, they finished their meals and Iroh then made some tea for the both of them and they then talked on the deck for the next few hours. It took a while, but Iroh was able to get Naruto to talk a bit more about his life in the village he came from so that he could understand Naruto better and know what he went through as he believed that it was always best to talk such issues and not bottle it up. When Iroh heard what the most of the people of his village had done to him, he could not help but feel a great deal of anger and disgust at the people's treatment of a young and innocent boy. He even felt slightly tempted to have his army disembark from his fleet and march on Konoha and burn it to the ground as nothing justified the attacking of an innocent young boy. This of course spoke volumes of how angry Iroh was, as he was not a violent man, but quickly enough Iroh pushed such thoughts away, as new violent actions only caused violent reactions, starting a never-ending cycle of hate. Iroh in turn shared some of the things that he had seen and what had happened in the war with his army, he even told Naruto about the loss of his only child and son Lu Tin. The two of them continued to talk for several hours, right up until the sun started to set. Upon seeing that it was going to get dark soon, Naruto thought it best that he go back to the abandoned building he was staying in. Well I guess I should go back now, thank you Iroh-san for lunch and for the tea, it was really nice spoke Naruto. When Iroh heard this, he knew that Naruto didn't have a real place to stay, as he had already guessed that if Naruto had run away and didn't have enough money to buy food or anything, then he most likely didn't have any real place to stay and most likely slept on the street or in some old abandoned building. This was unacceptable to Iroh, and so he decided to do something about it. Nonsense Naruto, you will stay here with us on this ship spoke Iroh. Thanks, Iroh-san, but I'm okay replied Naruto, as he knew that Iroh was trying to be nice and didn't really want someone pity, even though he would have liked to stay longer on the ship with Iroh on the crew, as they all seemed nice enough. Please stay Naruto, it's nice to have some youthful energy to brighten up this old gloomy ship, cajoled a smiling Iroh. Are you sure that it would be okay? Asked Naruto, to which Iroh smiled and nodded. Okay then, but I need to get some of my stuff, said Naruto, to which Iroh nodded and said he would help get the stuff for Naruto. The following three days after Iroh caught Naruto trying to pickpocket him were some of the best times that both Iroh and Naruto had experienced in a long time. During their time together, Iroh and Naruto were always seen talking with one another about things such as food, the different things in Konoha or the Fire Nation, and they even played a few childish games. Naruto especially enjoyed watching the crew along with Iroh sparring with one another and using fire bending, which Naruto was cool. He initially thought it was a jutsu, but Iroh quickly explained it wasn't, as they summoned and used a natural fire and did not create it with chakra, stating that natural fire was stronger than chakra-based fire. But like all good things, their time together came to an end as the damaged ships in Iroh's fleet were repaired and his fleet was restocked with enough food and water to return to the Fire Nation safely, hence they would be leaving tomorrow morning. It was because of this that Iroh came to a decision about Naruto, he knew that once he left that Naruto would be left alone to live on the streets and if he returned to the village he came from, he would just be beaten and abused again. Neither of which Iroh wanted for Naruto, as he had come quite fond of Naruto in the few days they had met. The days he had spent with Naruto, as he either played with or talked to Naruto, reminded him of the times when his son Lu Ten was alive and was Naruto's age and how he used to play with him. So at the end of the third day, when Iroh was on the bow of the ship with Naruto watching the sunset together, as Naruto told him he liked watching the sunset because he could away see his favorite color, orange. Iroh decided to tell Naruto that he would be leaving tomorrow. Naruto there is something I have to tell you spoke Iroh suddenly gaining Naruto's attention. What is it Iroh-san? Queried Naruto. I'm afraid that all my ships are repaired and so tomorrow morning my fleet will be leaving for home tomorrow. Oh said Naruto sadly, as he had enjoyed his time here and had liked Iroh, as other than the Hokage and the Raymond Chief Tucci and his daughter, he was the only real person that showed him any real kindness. So I guess that this is goodbye then, it doesn't have to be Naruto, replied Iroh as he knelt down to him. Naruto, although I know we have only met a few days ago, but I would like you to come with me, and if you would like, I would like to invite you to be in my family, said Iroh, as he was unsure as to what Naruto would say. 
At hearing this Naruto looked at up at Iroh in surprise, you mean why you want to adopt me? He asked in surprise. When he was younger and lived in the orphanage no one had even once offered to adopt him, yet here was Iroh, offering to open his heart and home to him. It was then that Naruto smiled with some tears in his eyes, after which he then hugged Iroh, showing that he accepted Iroh's offer to be his son. After a minute or so Naruto let go of the hug and then spoke up slightly nervously. W would it be okay if I called you dad? Asked Naruto nervously as he wasn't sure how Iroh would react at being called dad, as it was kind of weird in a way from him, as he never had to call anyone that. At this Iroh smiled with some tears in his own eyes, as he hadn't thought that he would ever be called that again, yes, it would be fine Naruto, after which he returned Naruto's hug. Iroh believed that maybe, just maybe, fate caused that storm in order to bring him here and to meet Naruto, where the two of them could find one another and be a family and heal the other's wounds. Early the next morning, Iroh's fleet set sail to return to the Fire Nation. As the fleet sailed away, Naruto and his new adopted father Iroh watched from the bridge's catwalk as the elemental nations disappeared into the horizon. His old life in the elemental continent was over, and his new life in the Fire Nation began today. Later on, in the late morning Kakashi and the Konoha team he was leading arrived in Gifu to look for Naruto. Pakin sniffed for Naruto's scent and tracked him first to an old abandoned building, where Naruto most likely stayed for a while. After that he tracked Naruto's scent to the docks where it ended. At first, Kakashi and the others thought that Naruto might have snuck aboard a ship sailing to one of the island countries like Yuki no Kuni, Snow Country, Yumi no Kuni, Sea Country, Mizu no Kuni, Water Country, Tsuki no Kunai, Moon Country, or even Nagi Island and Uyuzu Island. But when they asked some people about any ships that may have left in the past few days, they told them about the Fire Nation ships and how they only left a few hours ago. One of the sailors they had talked to had mentioned that he saw a young boy that matched Naruto's description, boarding the biggest ship of the fleet with the commander of the fleet. When Kakashi and the other asked where this Fire Nation was, where when Kakashi and the others first heard this, they thought it some kind of joke, but soon found otherwise, no one knew. The only thing that they did know for certain was that it was a country far away from the elemental continent. At this, Kakashi knew that Naruto was gone and out of their reach, as they now had no idea where Naruto was going, and no clues as to even find him. Kakashi looked out to the horizon of the sea with a sad look, I failed you sensei, I failed to be there for your son and protect him when he needed someone. I can only hope that wherever he is now he is happier and safer there than he was when he was in Konoha. Then he turned to his team, saying, we're heading back to Konoha. But what about Yuzumaki, shouldn't we try and chase after those ships? Asked Achunin. What would be the point? We have no clue where they are going or where this fire nation is, and even if we did, we don't know if they will give him back. According to the people here there was over a hundred ships in that fleet, each three times the size of any ship known here and made entirely of metal. With an entire army on board as well, what chance would we have of getting Naruto away from a force like that by ourselves? Replied Kakashi. At this the Chunin said nothing as he knew Kakashi was right, Naruto was out of their reach. Soon after Kakashi and his team left Gifu and headed back to Konoha and give Hokage the bad news. Currently sitting in the council room alone the Hokage waited for the council to show, as roughly an hour ago he had finished listening to Kakashi's report on his search for Naruto. When Kakashi finished his report Sarutobi knew that Naruto was now out of their reach now and could not help but be dismayed at the turn of events, knowing he had completely failed his successor and his wife. Even Kakashi was depressed at what had happened, where he had chalked it up as another one of his long list of failings, upon which he then went to the memorial stone and try and find forgiveness from his sensei the Yandame in failing to protect his son. Soon enough the council room filled up with the civilian council members, the clan heads the Anbu commander and Saratobi's advisors the shinobi elders, once everyone had entered the Hoja's advisor and former teammate Mitakado Himura stood up and spoke up. Okajama, why have you called this meeting, do you have any news on the whereabouts of the Kyuubi Jinchuriki? Not exactly replied the old Hokage. What do you mean by that Hokusan? Asked Yudatin Kaharu. Although Kakashi was able to find a solid lead to Naruto and was able to track him to the port city of Gifu, we lost him there, answered Saratobi. How? As surely the Kyuubi Jinchuriki couldn't get away from a squad of fully trained shinobis especially one that is led by someone as skilled as Kakashi, spoke Kaharu. It seems that when Naruto arrived in Gifu an armada of warships from an unknown foreign nation was off the coast of Gifu, where some of their ships were being repaired as they had been damaged during a storm, spoke the Sandame. The foreign armada? Are you saying that Hai no Kuni, Fire Country, and our village are being invaded by a foreign nation, Hokage-sama? Spoke Akamichi Choza. No, the armada was seemingly blown of course to Hai no Kuni coastal shore, where they were only at the port for a short period of time to make repairs to their ships, where they then left soon after, said the old Hokage, which settled the concerns of the council, as many feared another war starting. But still Hokage-sama, why does this involve the boy? Spoke in Yuzuka Tsum. 
It seems that when Naruto was there, when they arrived, where he was then taken aboard the Armada by the commander of the Armada, a man by the name of Iroh, where Naruto then left with the Armada, answered the Sandame Hokage. As soon as Saratobi said this, worried looks erupted among the clan heads and the elder shinobis, as this was the worst possible scenario, as the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi, the strongest of all the Bijus, was now in the hands of a foreign power. Then good riddance to it, spoke a civilian council member named Chijin, with that thing gone, Kanoha will be that much better off and safer. The silent Chijin you fool hissed Kaharu angrily, as she was in no mood to hear the stupid rants of fools that shouldn't be on the council to begin with. Surprised by Kaharu's harshness Chijin turned to her, but Kaharu-san, why do you even care you never shown any concern for it, as with it gone, we no longer have to the fear the Kayubi destroying our village, where it will become that nation's problem. Chijin you idiot, haven't you fools realized already how vital the Kayubi's power is to Kanoha's strength, spoke Hamura angrily. What do you mean by that? Asked another civilian council member named Daroka. When the Shadame Hokage defeated Madara, he was able to gain control of the Kayubi from Madara, after which the Shadame Hokage's wife Mito Sama sealed the Kayubi in herself, making her the first Jinchuriki of the Kayubi. Upon which the Shadame Hokage gave the Nanabi no Kabutamushi, seven tailed horned beetle, to Takagakur, hidden waterfall, and the other seven bijus to the other four great shinobi villages, at to try and maintain balance between the nations. Without the Kayubi Jinchuriki, our village's strength will be severely reduced, not to mention the fact that this nation could decide it to one day use the Kayubi's power against us, spoke Kaharu harshly. Even though the civilian council members were shocked at the fact that the Shadame Hokage's wife was a Jinchuriki, they quickly realized what kind of trouble this put their village. Then we must find him and bring him back, spoke a third civilian council member named Tanausha. It's a bit late for that now, as this nation already has Naruto, besides if fools like you had listened and respected the Yandame Hokage's dying wish, his son would never have left the village, cried the old Hokage angrily, as he no longer cared about hiding Naruto's heritage, as there was no point with him gone. Upon hearing this everyone minus the Hokage's advisors were shocked at this revelation, SS son spoke Chijin in shock. Yes Naruto is the Yandame Hokage's son, replied Siratobi. It's not possible I refuse to believe that, that demon is the Yandame Hokage's son, there's no wa cried Aroka before he shut up when the Sandame let loose a powerful burst of killing intent. Be silent. Roared out the old Hokage in a snar-like voice, as he glared at Aroka who felt like he had been killed over a hundred times, by how strong the killing intent was. The other council members along with the Hokage's advisors were of course shocked at the Sandame acting like this, even Danzo was surprised as he hadn't seen his former friend like this in a long time, where it reminded him of what Saratobi was once like before he became soft in Danzo's eyes. Naruto is Minato's son and is no more a demon than anyone else here, as he is just as much a human being as Mito-sama and his mother Kashina was, and if anyone here so much as call Naruto a demon or monster again they will answer to me spoke the furious old Hokage as he slammed his fist down on the arm of his chair angrily and glared at Aroka. Along with the other civilian members, as he blamed the ignorant fools and others like them in the village for Naruto running away. At this the civilian council members became very afraid as they had never seen Saratobi like this, but soon enough the old Hokage calmed down, although gave the civilian members a warning glare. One Saratobi calmed down a bit soon decided to spoke up, Hokage-sama, if I may why weren't we informed that Mito-sama and Kashina were also Jinchurikis for the Kayubi? As she had been friends with Kashina in their youth, yet had no idea that she was the Jinchuriki for the Kayubi, as it was commonly believed that Naruto was the first Kayubi Jinchuriki. The reason was because it was for Mito-sama's and Kashina's safety for fear of the other villages assassinating either to them to weaken Konoha or to capture them and use them against Konoha. Also it was to make sure that we would have a hidden ace in the hole, in case the village was attack, where our enemies wouldn't know who held the Kayubi. Not only that it was also to allow both of them to have happy normal lives and be accepted by the village, where they wouldn't have to suffer the harshness that other Jichurikis and other villages went through. But sadly that didn't work for Naruto as it became common knowledge that Naruto held the Kayubi in him, and due to the attack, many lives were lost, and people used Naruto as a scapegoat to focus their anger on, replied Sirobi sadly. But we know which country has taken Yuzumaki, spoke Danzo, hoping to know where to send his Rutnins and retrieve Naruto. The foreign nation called Fire Nation, replied the Sandame, where he got many strange looks from the other council members, but he assured them that it was the country's name. Then do we know where this Fire Nation is? Asked Kaharu. No, as all the people that Kakashi and his team interviewed knew was it was a place far off in the Southeast Sea, answered Saratobi. Do you think they know about the Kayubi? Spoke Danzo, as he saw no other reason why the commander of an armada would simply take in a boy off the street unless he had some value. I don't know, as it is unlikely given how the armada was just passing by, but even still it can't be ruled out, replied Saratobi. Then we must send out teams and find this fire nation and get him back. Spoke to Nausha. 
even if we do find this Fire Nation, how do you expect us to get Naruto back, as chances are this Fire Nation will not give him up, especially if they somehow know that Naruto has the Kyubi. Since given the description and size of the ships of this nation, the Fire Nation is more advanced militarily and technology, as the vast size of the Armada means they also have an equally vast army. Where if we were to enter their country without permission, it would cause an international incident and could be seen as an act of war on our part, and by just judging by the armada that was near Gifu alone, it would be a war that we would most likely lose. Especially if the fire daimyo doesn't support us, where he would most likely wouldn't, said Saratobi. But why, wouldn't he, they stole or Juchuriki, spoke Chijin. At this Saratobi could only scoff at the fact how Chijin, who was so pleased at Naruto gone mere moments ago, was now insisting that they risk a war to bring him back, when informed that without Naruto they would be in trouble, and with the fact that he was the Yandame Hokage's son. The Fire Daimyo would never support us if he found out how Naruto was treated here, which he would if the Fire Nation informed him of it, not to mention Naruto left with them willingly and was not forced to go. Hence the Fire Daimyo would not support us and most likely leave us to fend for ourselves, answered Saratobi. Upon hearing this, the council knew there was nothing they could do, as Naruto was beyond their reach now. At the same time Danzo secretly made plans in his mind to send out his root teams to search out and gather as much information about the Fire Nation as possible. Soon after Saratobi called the council meeting to an end, where he knew in the next few days, there would be a level of uproar, anxiety, fear and confusion of the likes that Kanoha has not seen, since when the Ichiha clan were massacred last year by the clan's prodigy Ichiha Itachi. He also knew that once the truth of Naruto heritage also came out, there would be also be a great division in the village, mainly between the younger and older generation. As the Sandame left the room, he could not help but hope that wherever Naruto was, he was happier and safer than he was in Konoha. With Naruto currently standing on the catwalk of the Empire-class battleship, Naruto was looking out into the distant coast of the Fire Nation. Naruto was kind of nervous and excited at the same time at seeing the Fire Nation and at seeing his new home, as well as meeting his new family. For the past several weeks his new adopted father Iroh had been teaching him as much as he could about the Fire Nation, such as history, culture, traditions and food. Naruto also had to learn to write again and how to show proper respect to other people, as Iroh had explained him how important it was, since if you disrespect someone, there would be harsh consequences. The learning was a bit dull for Naruto, but fortunately though Iroh was a patient and good teacher and helped keep Naruto interested. Also during his free time Naruto would play with either Iroh or some of the crew members or even play a few harmless pranks, which often helped to brighten up the ship up and help lighten the serious moods that the crew would normally have. Iroh also began to teach Naruto how to play Pai Show. at first Naruto showed no interest in it, but Iroh made it interesting by placing little bets, like if Naruto won he gets some candy or dare Iroh to do something funny. Naruto of course wasn't very good at first, but was slowly getting better at it and growing in confidence in it as well, where Iroh would sometimes let Naruto win, so to keep Naruto interested. Currently Naruto was wearing a tradition clothing wore by a child in the Fire Nation, one, which had been given to Naruto to wear by Iroh, after he had some of the crew make some new clothing for Naruto to wear. As Naruto gazed at the mainland of the Fire Nation, which was becoming bigger as they grew closer, he suddenly felt a hand land on his shoulder, when he looked up he saw his new adopted father smiling kindly and warmly at him. So Naruto are you excited at finally getting to see the Fire Nation? Asked Iroh. The yeah, I am, as well as kind of nervous, replied Naruto. Oh and why is that? Well what if they don't like me and what if they hate me like they did back at Konoha, what if? Said Naruto worriedly, before he was stopped by Iroh who held up his hand telling him to stop. There's no need to worry Naruto, as you my son now, and the people will not harm you, and I certain you will be happy here and make many friends there. I even have a young nephew there named Zuko who just two year older than you, as well as a young niece named Azula who is the same age as you. Hence I'm certain you three will get along fine and their friends can become your friends, said Iroh reassuring Naruto of his fears. At this Naruto calmed down a bit, where he was looking forward to meeting his new cousins and hoped they would get along, as he didn't really have any friends back at Konoha. After a while the Iroh's command ship docked at the port near the Fire Nation capital, where as Iroh, Naruto and his party disembarked the ship, they were met by members of the royal procession. General Iroh sir, we have been ordered by Fire Lord Ozai to escort you to the palace, as he wishes to speak to you, spoke an Imperial Firebender. Fire Lord Ozai? Spoke Iroh in surprise, where the Imperial Firebender just nodded in confirmation, what happened to my father then? Sadly you father Fire Lord Azalon passed away several weeks ago during the night, but before he died, he declared Fire Lord Ozai to succeed him, replied the Imperial Firebender. At this Iroh was slightly saddened, for although he and his father were never close, nor did they really talk much, that didn't involve military successes and defeats, as Azalon wasn't much of a father, but even still he was still his father, hence a small part of him did care for him. 
Very well then, led the way spoke Iroh where he then took Naruto by the hand and led him to a palanquin that was waiting for them and take them to the palace. When the Imperial Firebenders saw Naruto, the captain was about to ask who was Naruto, but Iroh simply replied that Naruto was with him, where the captain just nodded, after which Iroh and Naruto got in the palanquin. Upon which the servants then lifted them up and the guards surrounded them and then carried them to the palace. As they rode on the palanquin, Naruto looked out the curtains to see the harbor city and watched the people and look at the different things he saw in the city. He found it fun to be allowed to ride the palanquin, as he had seen important lords who came into Kanoha ride on them several times, and this was his first time riding on one. Although he still much preferred walking, as it was quicker, and in his opinion riding on the palanquin made him feel and look lazy. After about two hours of traveling on the palanquin and through the harbor city, Royal Plaza, the zing-zag path that lead up to the capital crater and through the Royal Caldera city itself, they finally arrived at the palace. When Naruto finally saw the palace he could not be but be in awe of it, as he had never seen anything so big in his entire life, the palace itself was easily three or four times the size of the Hukage mansion if not more. Once the palanquin was placed on the ground both Naruto and Iroh disembarked, where they were then escorted by the royal procession into the palace, where they walked through the large courtyard and through the large hallways of the palace. Finally though they arrived at giant double doors that lead to the throne room of the Fire Lord, where two other imperial firebenders stood on either side of it, guarding the entrance to the throne room. Where when they saw Iroh, Naruto and the royal procession coming they began to push the doors open, where Iroh and Naruto entered the throne room, upon which the doors then closed, while the royal procession stayed outside. The throne room was extremely large, where it had many black pillars with elaborate gold bases that supported the roof and had black tiled floors. As Naruto looked ahead he saw Fire Lord Ozai sitting on an ornate covered throne on a higher platform, which was surrounded by fire and made him extremely intimidating, as well as made Naruto slightly scared of him. He could also see a Ba's relief image of a dragon breathing fire behind the Fire Lord. As they walked up Naruto could feel the Fire Lord's eye on him, but kept his eyes low as his adopted father Iroh had explained to Naruto, he was not to stare up at the Fire Lord unless spoken to and was to remain quiet at all times, which Naruto didn't find hard as he was kind scared of him right now. Once Naruto and Iroh and sat down on their knees in front of Fire Lord Ozai, the Fire Lord suddenly spoke up. So General Iroh you have returned from your disgraceful failure at Ba Sing Si said Ozai with a slight sneer as he mocked his brother over his defeat. At this Naruto grew angry at the Fire Lord's insult to his adopted father, but he remained calm and did nothing, as Iroh, and told him to expect such remarks from people, where if he were to react to them, he could get into trouble for it. Iroh of course was not affected in the least by his younger brother's remark on his defeat at Ba Sing Si, yes I have Fire Lord, replied Iroh respectfully while holding a neutral expression. Oz I of course frowned slightly at seeing how his elder brother remained unaffected by his remark, but then decided to continue on, I had expected you to return sooner with you forces, what was it that delayed you so? Unfortunately my fleet had been caught in a large storm where we were blown off course and many of my ships had suffered damage and we had to make port in a foreign land to make repairs that took some time, answered Iroh. Upon hearing this Oz I became interested, where he had Iroh tell him about it, as he listened to Iroh's story, he became interested in the far off foreign land that he had never heard of. He even became slightly insulted that there was a country which had a similar name as his own, as in his own mind, there could only be one fire nation. After which he then began to question Iroh more on the elemental continent, he also became interested in the shinobi along with their jutsu, where they could use more than one element along with other things, he also became very interested in their bloodlines and their abilities. After an hour or so of questioning, Oz I then order Iroh to write up a full report on everything he learned about the elemental continent and to hand it in by next week, after which he then turned and looked at Naruto with a narrowing gaze. So who is this, is he some servant that you brought from this elemental continent? Asked Oz I. This is Naruto, and no he not my servant, I have adopted him as my son replied Iroh and placed his hand gently on Naruto's shoulder, who then looked up at the Fire Lord and then bowed down respectfully to Oz I, just as his adopted father had told him to do earlier. It is an honor to meet you Fire Lord Ozai. At this Ozai narrowed his eyes and then turned to Iroh. Did you honestly think that if you adopted this lowly commoner for a foreign land that you'd be allowed to still become Fire Lord when your real son was killed spoke Ozai. Naruto lowered his head as if in shame at how he wasn't Iroh actually son and never could be, but Iroh of course put a reassuring hand on Naruto's shoulder and then looked up at his brother. I had no such thought when I adopted Naruto, as I adopted Naruto, because I generally care for him greatly, replied Iroh, which caused Naruto smile, as he was happy beyond words to hear how Iroh cared for him. At this Oz I scoffed, regardless of your feelings towards this vagabond, I will not allow you to dirty our noble family by allowing some trash that you picked off the street enter our family. 
Upon hearing this Naruto began to become fearful at what would happen, where his fears of being scorned and hated in the Fire Nation, just as he was in Konoha began to resurface. Fortunately though Iroh would not let this happen, there is no law that prevents me from adopting Naruto, Ozai, spoke Iroh and referring his brother by his name, instead of calling him Fire Lord. That is Ozai started to grow angry at his brother defiance, where his angry became apparent, as the flames around him began to grow bigger and become fiercer. I'm the Fire Lord and my word is law spoke Ozai angrily, where Naruto began to become fearful at what would happen next, although held his nerve and didn't move. Iro then narrowed his eyes and then spoke calmly, if you allow me to adopt Naruto as a member of our family and as my son, then I will not challenge you for the throne. At this Ozai stood up in fury, where the flames around him exploded with equally fury, you would dare challenge me, your Fire Lord and my claim to the throne, along with our father's will shouted Ozai. At seeing this Naruto became more afraid at what Ozai would do, but Iroh placed a reassuring hand on Naruto, while still staring at Ozai, telling him that everything would be okay. This of course reassured Naruto, where he remained still, after which Iroh then spoke calmly with a calm expression, it is my right, as I was originally to be next in line. Ozai stared angrily at his older brother, while Iroh stared calmly yet intensely at Ozai, as the two brothers stared at one another in a battle of wills. Oz I began to think over his options, he knew that Iroh was well in his rights to challenge him in an Aikai for the throne, especially since he was the elder brother. He also knew that in terms of firebending skills, Iroh was the only one that could challenge him and possibly defeat him, not to mention the fact that Iroh had an entire army and armada loyal to him that was just outside the capital. Hence if he wanted to, Iroh could simply have his army attack the capital and take the throne by force, as the rest of the Fire Nation's armies were fighting in the Earth Kingdom, and the forces stationed at the capital that were loyal to him, Ozai, would stand no chance in defeating Iroh's veteran and experienced army. There was also the fact that despite his disgrace in failing to take Ba Sing Si, Iroh was still a very popular general among the army, hence it would be likely that many soldiers stationed at the capital would side and support Iroh if he wished to take the throne by force. But if he let Iroh adopt Naruto, Iroh would not challenge him for the throne, thereby his position as Fire Lord would be secure, and all it would take would be to let Iroh adopt Naruto into their family. Very well you can have him scoffed Ozai as he calmed down and sat back down, as allowing a commoner into the royal family was a small price to pay to secure his throne, he also believed that he could always use Naruto as leverage against his brother, should Iroh ever cause him trouble. At hearing Ozai response Iroh smiled, where Naruto remained quiet and kept his head down so that his face could not be seen. Once the matter over adopting Naruto was settled, Ozai then dismissed Iroh, not even looking at Naruto. Once they left the room Iroh dismissed the royal procession telling them that they weren't needed, after which when they were gone, Iroh then knelt down next to Naruto as he could tell that there was something wrong with his newly adopted son. Naruto what's wrong? You're not yourself. At this Naruto kept his down, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have to give up being Fire Lord, spoke Naruto, believing that it was his fault that his adopted father wasn't Fire Lord. Upon hearing his, Iroh lifted up Naruto's chin so that he could see Naruto's face, Naruto please listen to me, I do not care about being Fire Lord, and I never have, to me having you with me and being able to adopt you as my son is worth far more to me than ever being Fire Lord. Really, you're not angry at me? Asked Naruto. Really, replied Iroh with a smile, which caused Naruto to smile as well, where he then hugged Iron, who did so in return, after which he then asked Naruto if he wanted him to show him around the palace, which Naruto agreed to. After several hours of walking and touring around the palace, Naruto and Iroh entered the large open garden, where they then came across Iroh's young nephew Zuko, who was alone at the garden pond feeding turtle ducks. Naruto of course found them very strange, even though he had read about them in the books that Iroh had given him to read, it was still strange to see them. Iroh then called out to his nephew who turned and saw him and Naruto coming towards him, Zuko in turn called out to his uncle, where he went over to him and greeted him and then hugged him, which Iroh did so in return. Once Zuko let go of his uncle he then turned and looked at Naruto with a curious expression, before he then turned back to his uncle, uncle who is he? At this Iroh then knelt down to Zuko, Zuko I would like you to met Naruto, who I've adopted and will be you cousin from now on. This of course surprised Zuko, before he then he held out his hand in friendship towards Naruto and said hello which Naruto replied hesitantly and took Zuko hands. Seeing this of course brought a smile to Iroh's face, after which he then asked Zuko where his mother was as he wanted to introduce Naruto to her. When Iroh asked this a distraught look appeared on Zuko's face, where he then told Iroh that he didn't know and explained how she disappeared on the same night that Fire Lord Aslan suddenly died. Upon hearing this, Iroh frowned as he knew how much Ursa cared for both Zuko and Asla, and would never willing leave them, and would only do so if she was forced to, hence he knew that something was wrong. 
since given the facts at what happened, at how she disappeared on the very night that his father passed away and how Oz I was then declared the next Fire Lord, without waiting for his return, a which Iron found all too coincidental, and decided to investigate into the matter later on. For the next hour or so Iroh, Naruto and Zuko talked about Iroh's events in the war, after which Naruto then talked about the elemental continent, or to be more precise Konoha, where he told Zuko at how different yet similar it was from the other four great nations. Naruto in turn also asked the different things about Fire Nation especially the animals as he found the animals here funny looking, but interesting as they look like a cross between two separate animals from where he comes from, like the turtle ducks look like a cross between an ordinary duck and a turtle. Soon enough the three were joined by Azula, Mai and Tai Lee, who had seen Iroh and Naruto sitting and talking with Zuko, and were curious as to who Naruto was and what the three of them were talking about. Welcome back uncle greeted Azula as she Mai and Tai Lee came up to Iroh and the others. Ah, Azula my girl it's so good to see you greeted Iroh, as he turned to his young niece, look how much you have grown, you'll certainly become a lovely you girl when you get older, commented Iroh. After which he then noticed Mai and Tai Lee, ah and these must also your friends Mai and Tai Lee who have heard about. Nice to meet you said Tai Lee, hello replied Mai, uncle who is this? Questioned Azula as she looked at Naruto. Ah this is Naruto who is from a foreign land called the Elemental Continent, which is a land far from here, and I have adopted him, and he will be your new cousin, funny enough as well Naruto's home country is called Fire Country replied Iroh. This of course caused Azula to raise her eyebrow in curiosity, but before she could ask him Tai Lee interrupted her, that is so cool. Mai herself also found this interesting, as it was clear that Naruto did come from a far off land, she had never seen anyone with blonde hair before. Did father approve of this? Asked Azula, as she found it strange that her father would allow a foreign commoner to be a member of their family. Yes he did replied Iroh, which surprised Azula, where she then planned on asking her father later on, on why he allowed this. What are those marking on your face asked Mai, as she looked more closely at Naruto's face as saw Naruto whisker shaped birthmarks and found them strange. They're birthmarks, why, replied Naruto. Oh they're just funny looking, that's all replied Mai. I think they make you look cute, said Tai Lee with smile, which caused Naruto to blush as no one had ever said he looked cute in all his life. For the next few minutes Iroh talked about the elemental continent and how they had several kinds of fighting arts as they did here. But unlike in the four great nations they could do more than one elements and were created out of chakra. As the shinobis of the elemental continent could not bend the actually elements like benders could, not to mention there was a limit to what they could do, as if they ran out of chakra, they could no longer do jutsu. Upon hearing this Azula raised her eyebrow in interest at this and turned to look at Naruto and can you do any of these techniques that uncle mentioned. Only the basics, which are taught at the academy, replied Naruto, I can't do any of the elemental ninjutsus that father said. Azula and Zuko of course found it strange that a boy they had just met and who had no blood ties to their uncle and calling him father, but they got over it, where Zuko then asked what kind of jutsu he could do. Naruto turned to his adopted father, who nodded telling him that he could, after which Naruto then stood upon, where he the used a henge transformation and made himself into an exact copy of his adopted father Iroh. When the kids saw Naruto turn into an exact replica of Iroh they were all slack-jawed as they had never seen anything like this before. Wow that is so cool cried Tai Lee with excitement, even Azula, Mai and Zuko were surprised and impressed by that henge. After which Naruto then changed back to normal, where Zuko spoke up, can you change just into people or can you change into animals as well? I can change into a lot of things, like people, animals or objects, although it's tricky to keep up under long periods of time, and I have to constantly release a flow of chakra while mentally maintaining the form, answered Naruto. As he liked the attention he got from Zuko and the others as most people would ignore him, while only paying attention to him to laugh at him when he screwed up or when they were going to attack him. What else can you do? asked Tai Lee excitedly. Well I can also do this. Replied Naruto where he used the Kawarimi no Jutsu body replacement technique and replaced himself with a stone statue of a dragon nearby. This of course shocked the children, although Iroh remained calm as Naruto had shown him all this earlier on their way to the Fire Nation and he had read all this on some of the scrolls and books about shinobis that he bought in the elemental continent. When Naruto disappeared and in stone dragon appeared in the spot he was a moment ago, naturally the kids were once again in shock, where did he go? Ask a shock Tai Lee as she and the other looked around for Naruto. Looking for me? Said Naruto as he appeared from out of the tree trunk, as he used Kakuramino no Jutsu, cloak of invisibility technique, to blend in with the tree trunk and hide from everyone when they were distracted when he replaced himself with a stone dragon statue. Wow that's amazing. Cried Tai Lee, where Zuko and Mai nodded in agreement, even Asla had to admit that it was impressive, as she had never seen anything like those techniques before. Pretty impressive, but is that all they teach you there? Asked Azula, as she wanted to know as much as possible about Naruto's abilities, along with learn what the people of his land were capable of. 
That's all the jutsu I known although, we're also trained in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, along with throwing weapons, and how to fight with them in close quarters, as well as in speed and agility, answered Naruto. Upon hearing this Mai and Tai Li became interested, while Asla decided to ask something she wanted to know. Is it possible for us to learn the skills that you have? Naruto of course expect a question like this, although he hadn't expected from Asla, as he thought her father, Fire Lord Azai or some high-ranking general like his adopted father Iroh would ask it. No you can't, replied Naruto, which caused Azula to narrow her eyes and frown. And why not? Asked and annoyed Azula, as she believed that if a commoner like Naruto could do such things that she couldn't do, as she knew that even these basic abilities that Naruto showed would be highly useful in battle, along with gathering information and assassination. It because for some reason only people from my land can use them, replied Naruto. And how can you be so sure of that? Asked Azula not believing Naruto. Because dad asked me to teach him how to use them as well as some of the crew on the ship we were on, but none of them could do it answered Naruto. I'm afraid it is true Azula replied Iroh, although in reality this was all a lie that he told Naruto to tell anyone that asked if he could teach them his techniques. As Iroh suspected that considering how similar the bending arts and the shinobi arts were with one another. It would be possible for other people outside Naruto's homeland to learn it. But Iroh wanted to make sure that his brother and the military officials in the Fire Nation military to believe that it was impossible. As he knew that if Naruto taught these basic skills, then Ozai would take Naruto from him and force him to teach others, not to mention he knew that his brother would then use these skills to further the war in conquering the other nations. Not to mention he would send forces to the elemental continent to conquer it, so to learn more of the shinobi arts and make himself more powerful. This was also why he planned to make sure not to tell Ozai everything in his written report and lie in it in many parts of it, where he would make it seem that he, Iroh, did not know too much about the shinobi world, which was sort of turn. While at the same time making shinobi seem powerful enough that it would be too much trouble to try and conquer them, while also making them seem as well that they were no threat to the Fire Nation. But even still Iroh knew that it would be only a matter of time before his brother would eventually turn his gaze to the elemental continent, as he knew his brother wouldn't be satisfied unless the whole world was under his control. But it would at least by some time, where at some point something could be done to stop this pointless war and prevent another one from breaking out. After hearing that it was unlikely that she could do any ninjutsu Azula became annoyed as she didn't like being upstaged by anyone, hence she decided to go off practice her firebending skills. Or Mai and Tai Li followed after her, but not before Tai Li and Mai said goodbye to Iroh, Zuko and Naruto, although when Mai said goodbye to Zuko, she blushed a little, which Iroh noticed and smiled, as he also noticed Zuko blush a little as well, when she said goodbye to him. Ah, to be young again chuckled Iroh, which of course confused Naruto, as he didn't get what his adopted father was talking about, as he had seen Zuko and Mai blush a little when they said goodbye to one another, but didn't understand why. What do you mean by that dad? Why were Mai and Zuko blushing when they said goodbye to one another? Asked Naruto. Ah, you understand later on Naruto with you get a little older and met a special young lady yourself, replied Iroh with a knowing smile. Huh? Said Naruto not getting his adopted father at all, but decided to let it go. After which Iroh suggested that since it was such a nice day that the three of them leave the palace and go out for a walk into the Caldera City to show Naruto more of the Fire Nation, as well as have a nice meal outside the palace. Both boys of course agreed, as Naruto was eager to see more of his new home the Fire Nation, and more importantly hopefully find a place where they make Raymond, if they hopefully had it. Zuko on the other had thought it would be interesting, as he was interested in learning more about Naruto and the land he came from, and although he wouldn't admit it. He did enjoy his uncle's and Naruto's company as other than his mother, he didn't really have any friends to hang around with or someone to talk to. Once it was agreed, the three sent off together, where Naruto the former pariah of the Konoha, began his new life as a prince of the Fire Nation. 6. Also as well whose fucking idea was it to have Shyamalan do the last airbender, come on the guy doesn't exactly have a great reputation for making films, with the exception of Sixth Sense and perhaps Unbreakable and Signs, but all the other films he's done have been a load of crap, I can think about a dozen or so good decent directors that could have done a far better job than him. Hell everyone calls the guy one trick pony, which is short of true as he hasn't done a good film in ages, god. I can only pray that they wise up and get someone better and do a better job in the next one, although something tells me that my praise would be in vain. Overall with a few good points, the movie itself was a generally let down, where the movie world yet again ruined another good thing, where they could never live up to or compare to the original. Just like with what they did when they made the Dragon Ball and I'm, Harry Potter books and the arrogant book into movies, with the exception of Lord of the Rings, Narina and Transformers, as they did superb jobs on them. Another thing to note is that flames are not welcome here as I force no one to read my stories, and if you don't like them, then don't read them. Also please note that all flames will be ignored, or the flamers will be flamed back. 
Now as I stated in my previous chapters, I know that my grammar and spelling can be a problem for some people I sorry. But I doing the best I can with what I got. Currently sleeping in a large silk bed, in a large room in the palace of the royal family of the Fire Nation, was Naruto, where when the early morning sun shone through the open balcony of his bedroom. The rays of the sun hit Naruto's closed eyes, where he then slowly woke up. Once Naruto woke up, he sat up, revealing his crimson royal red bed robes that all members of the royal family wore when going to bed. After waking up he let out a large yaw and then looked out the open balcony doorway and saw the sun rise over the royal caldera city, as he looked out he saw the clear bright morning sky and could tell that it was going to be a beautiful day. After looking out to the city, Naruto heard the large double doors open to his bedroom that were directly in front of his bed, where when he turned to look he saw a young girl entering his bedroom. The girl in question was Naruto's personal servant, who had been assigned to Naruto after he was officially adopted by Iroh and was made a member of the royal family. Normally, a member of the royal family would be assigned up to four or five servants, but Oz Ayan stated that, since Naruto was not born of royal status, he would only be assigned one. This of course did not matter to Naruto, as he didn't really care, as he could have easily have done just as well without a servant. The girl in question was an 18-year-old girl named Min, she was medium height and had a slim figure, with an attractive enough face, and she had dark brown hair that was tied up in a bun, and had light grey eyes, and wore standards clothes of servants of the royal court. Min's family had served the royal family for over five generations, which was considered a great honor by most people. Her mother was one of the royal cooks of the royal kitchen staff, her father was the head servant to the fire lord's personal staff of servants, and her younger sister was the one of the cleaners of the palace. When Naruto first met Min, she treated him kindly enough and helped him get new clothes to wear when he went out, as well as showed him other parts of the palace that Naruto didn't know about so that he wouldn't get lost, as well as how to call for her or other servants when he needed something. When he was introduced to Min, she of course bowed on her knees respectfully, like to most members of the royal family, and called him Prince Naruto or your highness, when Naruto tried to get her to just call him Naruto, the young teenage girl was of course horrified at the idea. It was only till later that Iroh explained to Naruto that servants were not allowed to address a member of the royal family in such a familiar manner, where if they did, they would be severely punished for it. After learning of this Naruto of course apologized to Min and explained to her that he didn't know, eventually though he was able to convince Min to call him Naruto whenever they were alone and nobody could hear them. But would refer to him as Prince Naruto or His Highness when in front of others. For the past six months since he arrived in the Fire Nation, things had not been entirely easy for Naruto, which wasn't a surprise, since he had known that things would not be easy for him. After he was officially adopted as Iroh's son, he was introduced to many of the different noble families who lived in the royal caldera city, and although there were those among the nobles that generally treated Naruto kindly and respectfully, there were many who did not. For although all the nobles he met treated him respects, he soon learned that many of the noble and more traditional families did not like not him. Since many of them believed that a foreign commoner did not deserve to be elevated to a prince of the Fire Nation, while others were simply jealous of Naruto becoming a member of the royal family. Naruto also later on learned that some of the other families that were friendly with him were only doing so to try and elevate their status in the social hierarchy of the Fire Nation. Naruto also had a hard time trying to learn all the main events of the Fire Nation's history, as well as all the other traditions that Iroh had yet to teach him, since Iroh knew how easy people could use or mock Naruto due to his lack of knowledge of these things. But as hard as all these things were on Naruto, none were harder than his meetings with his new adopted uncle Fire Lord Azai, who made it his own personal mission to belittle, insult and mock both Iroh and Naruto whenever he got a chance, especially in front of other people. Although Iroh and Naruto were both able to ignore or laugh away such remarks by Azai, some of the things that Azai had said did indeed hurt Naruto, where Iroh would later have to talk to Naruto and assure him that the things that Azai said were untrue. But despite all these things there were some good things that happened to Naruto, one such things were that in the Fire Nation, he actually had friends. These friends were his new cousin Zuko, Tylee and Mai. Throughout the six months since he arrived, Naruto had often talked or played with one of his new friends. Although most of the time he would hang out with Zuko, since both boys didn't really have any friends before they met one another, while Mai and Tylee usually hung with Azula. Although Zuko and Naruto had several different qualities, where Zuko could be domineering, controlling and strict, a result of being raised as Fire Nation royalty, and disdained the idea of doing things with people that he believed are inferior to him. While Naruto was more passive, easygoing and enjoyed cutting loose and having fun, much like his adopted father in certain ways, and also didn't mind doing menial work for himself or with the servants. Both boys shared many common traits and in some ways history with one another, despite their differences. 
both Zuko and Naruto didn't have great childhoods, where Naruto was hated and attacked by his former homeland, while Zuko was treated with distant and in some ways disgust by his father, since he was not a not a natural prodigy like his sister Asla, and often made mistakes. Both boys also shared a common thirst to prove themselves and to be acknowledged by others, where when in Konoha, Naruto had wanted to become Hokage, so that people would acknowledge him. But after becoming a member of the royal family of the Fire Nation, his thirst for acknowledgement had changed slightly, where although he was acknowledged by others, it was not for the reasons he wanted. Since Naruto knew that most people only acknowledge him because he was adopted by Iroh, which was why he still wanted to be acknowledged by others, as he did not want to be known as the lowly commoner, who was lucky enough to be adopted by the famed Dragon of the West. Naruto wanted people to acknowledge him for himself and to step out from the great shadow that his adopted father placed over him, not that Naruto is ashamed or ungrateful to Iroh, he just wants to stand on his own two feet and be acknowledged as someone other than Iroh's adopted son. Like Naruto, Zuko also wanted to be acknowledged, but by his father, and win his love and prove himself worthy of him. Naruto and Zuko also both shared a strong determination to prove themselves, which they used to struggle past their own personal troubles and to never give up on to reach their own individual goals. The two boys even shared a strong belief in refusing to view people as expendable or worthless and that it was the duty of the royal family that to protect and serve the people of their nation. Both boys even supported one another, where whenever Zuko was ignored by his father for Asla or made a mistake that angered his Azai. Naruto would cheer Zuko up with some jokes or give him a pep talk. In return, Zuko would stand up for Naruto whenever someone made a snide remark about him or encourage Naruto whenever he trained to try and use firebending, since despite his great efforts in the past few months, Naruto had shown no talent in being able to use firebending. Naruto also has good relationships with Tai Li and Mai, where Naruto and Tai Li found they had a lot in common with one another, where Tai Li was goofy and liked to have fun, much like Naruto. Both often even used their own natural agility and acrobatically skills to have races or competition with one another, where they jumped and ran through the large gardens of the palace and the trees in them, as well as onto the rooftops of the palaces. The two of them even trained to improve their hand-to-hand -hand fighting styles, where both improved greatly from training with one another, where Naruto could even hold his own for a while against Tai Li. Mai on the other hand was a little difficult to befriend, as she was emotional distance from most people and would often be found alone and stay silent. Naruto of course tried to make friends with Mai, but each time was turned away by her, it was only until he came across her by accident throwing some small knives at a wall that he was able to make some progress at becoming friends with her. When he came across her and saw her throwing her knives at the wall, Naruto made another attempt to talk to her, at first Mai ignored him, but Naruto was persistent and then challenged her to a knife throwing contest. Naturally at being challenge added, Mai became interested, where the two of them in a contest to find out who was the better shot, naturally of course Mai won. But Naruto achieved his goal, where Mai offered to give him some pointers in throwing and offered to give him a rematch if he was interested. Naruto of course accepted, where the two of them would practice their throwing skills four times a week together, where both of them greatly improved their aiming and throwing skills and had fun doing it. But even becoming friends with Zuko, Mai and Tai Li, Naruto did not get on well his other cousin Asla. Naturally Naruto tried to become friends with Asla, and at first it seemed they were becoming friends, that was until Naruto accidentally overheard Asla talking with Tai Li and Mai at how she didn't even like him and how she planned to use his skills to do things she wanted. When Naruto learned this, he naturally angry and upset by what Asla said, hence after learning this Naruto decided to unleash his anger at Asla with a series of pranks. These pranks involved things like filling balloons with water and dropping them from the roof down at Asla when she was walking outside. Others also involved where Naruto put red dye in her bubble bath so that when she stepped out her bath and looked at herself in the mirror she saw her skin turn completely red. Another prank was where Naruto found some mayapple plants on one of his walks with his adopted father outside the capital and took some. Since from his walks Naruto learned a lot of things about plants from his father, although he often had to double check some of the things his dad told him, as Iroh often mixed the plants up with others. When Naruto came across the mayapple plants Iroh told him that when grinded up and given in small amounts, it can cause a person severe diarrhea. Naturally Naruto secretly took some of the plant's leaves, grinded them up, and sprinkled some of them on Asla's food without her knowing. Where for several days, Asla spent most of her time in the bathroom unable to leave it, yet despite all these pranks and knowing that Naruto was the cause, neither she nor anyone else could ever prove that Naruto was behind them, hence he could never be punished. Knowing that she couldn't have Naruto punished, nor could she intimidate him, since Naruto was the only person, with the exception of her father and Iroh, that wasn't scared of her in some way. Asla struck back at Naruto by teasing him and making side remarks at him in front of others, knowing he couldn't strike back. 
She also made it a point to make fun of Naruto's lack of skill at be able to do firebending, saying it proved he wasn't a true member of the royal family since he couldn't firebend. She even made sure to show her own skill in firebending in front of Naruto in the hope of showing how inferior he was to her. She also even made sure to limit Naruto's time with Mai and Tai Lee, where the girls could only spend a limited time with Naruto and in secret. This of course hurt Naruto, since he knew what Azula was doing, as he knew that both Tai Lee and Mai were only friends with Azula because they were afraid of her and what she might do to them, although Tai Lee may general believed that Azula was her friend. But even despite all this bad things, Naruto found his life in the Fire Nation much better than his life in Konoha, especially when he was with his adopted father Iroh, who he was already forming a close bond with. Over the six months in the Fire Nation, Naruto spent a lot of time with his new father, where they played Pai Show, where Naruto was slowly improving. Iroh even encouraged Naruto to play an instrument, where he got Naruto to start learning to play the flute. He even started to teach Naruto how to make tea, where Naruto was slowly but steadily improving, but still nowhere near as good as his father, at least not yet. Also during the six months since he arrived in the Fire Nation, Iroh attempted to teach Naruto to firebend, but sadly, had showed little to no talent in being able to firebend much to the young boy's disappointment. But thankfully Iroh encouraged Naruto, saying that there was still hope and that they would keep trying. When Min entered the room she quickly bowed to Naruto in respect, good morning Prince Naruto, I hope you slept well. The AI did, thanks replied Naruto as he then got out of bed and stretched, where he then headed to the bathroom to wash up, whereas he did Min began to make his bed and then lay out fresh clothes for Naruto to wear for the day. After which he then left the room to give Naruto some privacy to change, once he left the bathroom and to get his breakfast. After a while Naruto came out of his private bathroom, cleaned and washed, where he then went over to his bed where Min had left his clothes. When Naruto had just finished changing, there was a knock on his door, where after saying enter Min appeared again with a breakfast tray with a bowl of egg fried rice, freshly squeezed juice, bread and fruit on it. Min then left the tray on a small table, where Naruto could enjoy his breakfast. Seeing this Naruto thanked Min before she left the room and told her to thank her mother as well for cooking breakfast, Min of course nodded and told Naruto she would. Naruto of course fairly popular among the servants of the royal palace, as like them Naruto was not born of royal blood, but yet was a member of the royal family. He treated the servants with respect and did not talk down to them like most nobles or high-ranked officials. He even often helped the servants who had difficulties with certain tasks they were assigned, like when a young servant boy was carrying a heavy load of laundry and had trouble carrying it all to the washroom. When Naruto saw this he naturally went over had helped the boy and brought some of the load to the washroom, Naruto even defends certain servants when they were wrongfully accused of something or were simply insulted by certain nobles or high rank officials. This of course did not win him many point s with the higher class, but won him a lot of support in the servant class. Naruto got on especially well with Min Mother, as she was the only cook in the entire royal palace that could a decent bowl of ramen, which was nearly as good as Ichiraku ramen, which he eat ate back in Kanoha nearly every day. As Naruto finished his egg fried rice, he took the tray and carried it out to the balcony and put the tray on the large stone balustrade that kept him from failing off the balcony. Naruto then took the bowl of fruit and placed in on a large thick branch of a large tree that grew next to the balcony, on the tree was a miniature little house the size of a large doll house. Once Naruto placed the bowl of fruit on the thick branch in front of the small house, he cried out breakfast time. Where when he did, a small little monkey with a small red and white rob around its neck immediately came out and raced towards the bowl. 2. When Naruto saw the monkey he smiled kindly at his little friend and gentle panted the little monkey on the head. Hey. Zio's I, 3, how are you today? Where the little monkey then cried eek. And smiled up at Naruto, before it then took a large grape from the bowl and took a bite out of it. Seeing this Naruto couldn't help but smile, where he patted his little friend gently on the head. Naruto had gotten Zio's I, 2 months after his arrival in the Fire Nation, he had found Zio's I at an animal stand when he was walking through Harbor City with his father. As they walked through the city, Naruto had noticed the animal stand out of the corner of his eyes, when he went to look over he saw Zio's eye sitting in his cage, looking unwell, as if it had given up on living. Seeing the poor thing, Naruto could not help but pity him, where he asked his father to buy it for him. At first Iroh was unsure at buying the little monkey, but after seeing the concern look on his son's face and at seeing the condition of the little monkey, he too took pity on it and decided to buy the little monkey. When the salesman heard that Iroh and Naruto wanted to buy Zio's eye, he tried to convince them that another one of his animals would be better, as he believed that Zio's eye would not live much longer. But Iroh insisted that he would only take Zio's eye, where the salesman soon agreed. After buying Zio's eye, Naruto and Iroh quickly took him back to the palace, where they nursed him back to health, but once the little monkey was well enough, kept trying to running away from both Naruto and Iroh, showing that he was afraid of them and that he had a bad experience with other humans. 
Eventually though after many weeks, Naruto gained Zio's eyes trust, after which Iroh suggested Zio's eyes name, where when the little monkey heard it, he immediately liked it. After Zio's eye became his official new friend, Naruto began to take Zio's eye everywhere he went, where it became a common sight to see Zio's eye on Naruto's shoulder, and if Zio's eye was on his own, everyone knew that Naruto was somewhere nearby. After gaining Zio's eye trust, Naruto found that Zio's eye was quite an intelligent monkey, where he was able to understand much of what Naruto was saying and able to do things for himself. Later on Naruto then introduced him to his other friends, Zuko of course found the sight of Naruto having a monkey suited his new cousin perfectly, consider the amount of mischief he get up to from time to time. Most of the time Zuko did not pay too much heed to Zio's eye, but there were some times where Zuko was acutely quite kind to Zio's eye, where he pet him on the head now and again and would even give him some piece of food now and again. Zuko even admitted once or twice that he found Zio's eye kind of cute. Mai of course didn't pay much heed to Zio's eye either, although eventually like Naruto the little monkey wormed his way through my thick outer shell, where Zio's eye would do little tricks that Naruto taught him in front of Mai, which would actually make her smile a little. This of course then made Zio's eye the one of only three people that could make Mai smile, the others being Naruto and Zuko. Aili of course adored Zio's eye, where when she first saw him, she let out high-pitched squeal and then grabbed hold of Zio's eye and proceeded to nearly squeeze the poor little monkey to death because of how cutty was. Eventually though Naruto got Tylee to calm down, thereby saving his little friend's life, after which he and Zio's eye would practice doing little acrobatic tricks, which Tylee loved to watch and join in. Despite the uncomfortable first experience, Tylee also quickly became Zio's eye's favorite person, second only to Naruto, due to the amount of attention that she would give him and how she would spoil him with sweet berries that she would bring. The three of them would also have fun having little races as they jumped through the trees in and around the palace, whereas Io's eye would normally win, due to his small size, where he could running much faster and take shortcuts that Tylee and Naruto couldn't. Iroh also got on quite well with Zio's eye, where the little monkey would often come to Iroh for treats or play with him when he could not with Naruto. The only real people that Zio's eye didn't get on with were Azula and Azai, where both of them scared the little monkey, where whenever either or both of them were nearby Zio's eye would hide inside Naruto's shirt until they were gone. The reason why Zio's eye was so scared of them both was because Azai had a natural cruel cold aura around him, which Naruto could attest to, as by even looking at him for the first time anyone could tell that the man was about as friendly as two-headed rat viper. Azula on the other hand called Zio's eye an overgrown rat, where she tried to use him as target practice for her firebending. Thankfully though Naruto was able to save Zio's eye when she tried to do this, and Zio's eye got his own back on Azula, where he snuck into her room and sprinkled inching powder on the inside of her clothes, where Azul spent most of the morning scratching herself, until she finally changed her clothes and washed herself. But even after this the poor little monkey was still very much afraid of Azula, especially when she looked directly at him. Once both Naruto and Zio's eye had finished their breakfast, Min knocked on the door again and entered the room to collect Naruto dishes, after which she then told Naruto that she had a message from his father, saying that he would meet Naruto in the courtyards. Upon which they would then head for their private training ground in the forest outside the capital, where they trained on Naruto firebending skills. Naruto of course nodded in understanding and thanked Min before she left with the dishes, after which Naruto then called Zio's eye over towards him, who quickly jumped of his branch and ran to his master and climbed up onto his shoulder and sat on it. When Naruto left his room he was soon joined by two imperial firebenders, who were his personal bodyguards when he planned to leave the capital, normal when a member of the royal family left the palace or the capital, they would have a dozen or so imperial firebenders. But since Naruto wasn't a true member of the royal family, Ozai decided to give Naruto only two. This of course actually suited Naruto, as he didn't like the idea of half dozen of armored guys around him at all times, an added bonus was that his father Iroh had been able to arrange so that the guards were former guards that had protected him during his time in the war. Hence Iroh knew that he could trust the men to protect Naruto, as well as make sure that Ozai hadn't placed men that were loyal to him, who would spy on him, Iroh and Naruto. Naruto of course became quite friendly with both his guards Hu and Zhang, both men were middle age, who had severed his father Iroh through the war loyally and held him in the utmost respect. Both men were also men were highly skilled firebenders who had fought in many battles alongside Iroh. The two men were of course very polite to Naruto and became quite friendly with the young blonde during the six months since he came to the Fire Nation. Naruto of course enjoyed both his guards company where he found the Zhang to be quite funny where he would tell a lot of good jokes and even encourage Naruto when he fell down after doing badly in his firebending training which was all the time. Who on the other hand was quite a serious man where he had fought many fierce battles against the Earth Kingdom where he had a large scar that went down his left eye. 
Yet despite his somewhat frightening appearance, he general respectful and friendly man, who like Iroh, was very wise due to his many years on the battlefield. Naruto of course enjoyed listening to some of Hu's war stories, where he often hoped that one day he would become a great firebender, just like his adopted father. After a few minutes Naruto and his two guards arrived to meet Iroh and his guards in the courtyard, where after greeting them the company, they headed out of the palace and walked out the capital and into the large forestry outside the capital, where they went to a large clearing, where Iroh and Naruto did their training. The guards of course kept guard a distance away from the clearing so that Iroh and Naruto could train in private, while at the same time making sure that no one could spy on Iroh and Naruto. After entering their training clearing area, Iroh then lit a small fire and then took out a small kettle and some tea cups and a small bag of tea ingredients and began to make some tea. Seeing this, Naruto began to get confused since he had expected to do some training similar to what they had done the past few months. Hey dad what are you doing? I thought we were doing some training today. We don't usually have tea till afternoon or evening, spoke Naruto. He can be have it any time Naruto, that's the wonderful thing about it, and it can help calm the mind and focus it, which is what we are trying to do today, as if we help calm your mind and focus it, I believe it can help with your firebending, spoke Iro. But what if I simple can't bend, what if I'm just talentless like Azula and everyone back at Kanoha used to say to me? What if you're just wasting your time with me? Asked Naruto, as after many years of being put down by people he could not help but have a low opinion of himself from time to time, especially when he was doing badly at something. Nonsense Naruto, you've talent deep inside of you, as no one is bored without talent, said Iroh with a reassuring smile, which cheered Naruto up. After a few minutes, Iroh had finished making jasmine tea, which was to help calm Naruto's mind. After Naruto had finished drinking his tea, along with Zayo's eye, who had a little sip of tea with his master, he then positioned himself into a meditation position, which Iroh had taught him. Meditation of course had been hard for Naruto to do, but thankfully Iroh was a patient man and teacher, where eventually he taught Naruto how to calm him mind and focus it. He found it especially helpful when training Naruto to do this by having him drink something calming like jasmine tea. Once Naruto fell into his meditation position, he began to focus his mind, for the first few minutes not much happened for Naruto, but eventually something did happen. Enter Naruto's mindscape. As Naruto was meditating he suddenly found himself in a large dark tunnel, filled up to his ankles in water. Where the hell am I? Asked Naruto out loud as he looked around the dark tunnel. Knowing he wouldn't get any answers by just standing around Naruto started to walk forward to see where the tunnel ended. After a few minutes Naruto reached the end of the tunnel where he entered a large room with a massive cage at the other end of the room with a large paper seal in front of it acting like a lock between the two cage doors. Deciding to investigate further, Naruto walked towards the cage where once he was only a few feet from the cage. He suddenly stopped as he saw a pair of massive glowing red eyes open wide, followed by a massive mouth with razor-sharp teeth. It was then that Naruto realized who the creature was due to seeing pictures of it from books he read when he was in the academy. Iwubi muttered Naruto in a soft whisper of surprise, as he had always been told that the Yandame Hokage had killed the Kaiubi. So my tenant has finally graced me with his presence spoke the Kaiubi in a dark menacing voice, which would have made many brave men shudder in fear. But Naruto showed no such thing and just stared at the Kaiubi. Um, impressive you've some courage as you don't seem afraid of me, but then again I would nothing less from that man's son spoke the Kaiubi in amusement when he saw that Naruto was unafraid of him. Where am I? How are you alive? As the Yandame Hokage was said to have killed you years ago. And what do you mean by his son? Do you mean that you know who my birth father is? Demanded Naruto as he stared at the Kaiubi, as he clearly knew things that he wanted to know. Eh, hey, so you don't know do you? asked the Kaiubi in amusement as he found the fact Naruto didn't even know who his parents were. Tell me. Demanded Naruto as he wanted answers. Fine, since I find you so amusing, answered Kaiubi as he smirked slightly at Naruto staring at him angrily. We're currently inside a seal that was placed on you by your wretched father the Yandame Hokage, as despite what you have been told he didn't kill me, as I cannot be killed. The Yandame Hokage could only seal me away, where when you were born, he sealed me into you. At hearing this Naruto's eyes widened in shock, the why Yandame Hokage is my father and sealed you into me when I was born. Said Naruto in shock, where the Kaiubi just nodded. When Naruto heard this everything in his life in Kanoha suddenly made sense, the fact that everyone in Kanoha hated him, the fact that everyone called him demon or monster, it now made perfect sense. To them Naruto was representation of the demon that nearly destroyed Kanoha and killed so many of their loved ones. Realizing this, Naruto could not help but feel angry at what his father had helped do him, as he was the one who placed the Kaiubi into him and subjected him to nine years of hell. But whether he knew what would happen to him or not did not matter to Naruto, for as far as he was concerned Iroh was his father, who had taken him in and cared for him like his own son. Well the Yandame was nothing more than a stranger who him placed a demon into him when he was born. 
indeed and he was the one who placed me into you, and your mother was also the pervious host to me before you, wait. My mother was also just like me, and had you placed into her spoke Naruto correct, where the Kaiubi just nodded again. But why? Because your village wanted to use my power to keep them strong, and the only way to do that was to place me into a human like you and have you use my immense power for their benefit. At hearing this Naruto became angry at how both he and his mother were both used by Konoha, so to keep it strong. Well at the same time the village treated him like the plague and made his life hell for something that wasn't his fault. But if you were sealed into my mother, why are you in me? Asked Naruto as if what the Kaiubi said was true, then the Kaiubi should have been in his mother or at least died with her. Because on the day you were born, a man wearing a orang mask kidnapped your mother after she gave birth to you, since the man knew that when a female Jinch Kriki gives birth, the seal of their demon weakens allowing said demon like myself to break free, spoke the Kaiubi. After he kidnapped your mother he the used his powers to free me and the place me under his control and had me attack your former village in the hopes of destroying it. But in the end your father the Yandame Hokage freed me of the man's control and then later stopped me by sealing me into you. And what happened to my parents? Asked Naruto. I killed them replied Kaiubi. You what? Cried Naruto in shock. I killed them, although to be honest they were already dying as the technique that your father used cost him his life and your mother was slowly dying. Since the process of extracting any biju like myself from their host is so painful that they will die from it, answered the Kaiubi without the slightest bit of remorse for what he had done. At hearing all this Naruto glared at the Kaiubi with every ounce of hate he could muster in himself and aim it at the Kaiubi, for not only was this creature that was one of the reasons why he had such a miserable life. But it was also the being that killed both his parents and had left him an orphan. After a few minutes at glaring at the Kaiubi, Naruto took several deep breaths to calm himself down, just as his adopted father Iroh had taught him. Upon when he then looked directly at the Kaiubi and spoke again. Who was the masked man that freed you? Asked Naruto, since as far he was concerned that man was the main cause of all his suffering, as it was he who had freed the Kaiubi and had basically killed his mother. His name is Ichiha Madara replied the Kaiubi. Ichiha. Thought Naruto, as he remembered the name of the famed clan of Konoha, as one of his former classmates Sasuke was a member of the clan, but before Naruto could think more on the matter, the Kaiubi continued to speak. He was the co-founder of your former village and was the former rival of your Shadai Hokage, who he fraud and lost to later on. So why are you telling me all this, as I doubt you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart, nor do I think that you're just doing because you like talking to me spoke Naruto. At this the Kaiubi smirked again in amusement, maybe you aren't as stupid as you look commented the Kaiubi, causing Naruto to glare angrily at him. The reason that I'm telling you all this is because I'm going to give you a special gift. At hearing this, Naruto narrowed his eyes I don't want any gifts from you, not after everything you did to me, he said angrily. Are you sure you don't want what I have to offer? Especially since I can offer you the ability to firebend, but also give you special flames that are unlike any others. How can you do that? You're not even from this land, how can you even teach me to firebend? Asked Naruto, not believing the Kaiubi and believing that it was some sort of trick. Ghoulish child, I'm a spirit and have lived longer than any other human alive and have seen much. The bending arts themselves were taught by the great spirits of the spirit world to you human in this land. Unlike you shinobis from the elemental continent, where you developed your own fighting styles that mimic the bending arts by using chakra instead of bending the actual elements as they do here. At hearing this, Naruto had to admit what the Kaiubi said did make sense, since the Kaiubi was a demon, meaning he was basically a spirit and couldn't die of old age. But even still he did not believe the creature, considering all the suffering he put him through and how the Kaiubi was basically evil who loved causing chaos and destruction. What exactly are you offering me? Asked Naruto, for even though he hated the Kaiubi and did not trust him, he would at least hear what he has to say. I offer you not only the ability to be able to do firebending, but also these flames, spoke the Kaiubi, where he lifted up his paw up and squeezed it through the bars and showed Naruto a small white flame. I offer you the flames of Kanjin, a Japanese god of fire, which are the scared white flames of the heavens, which burn as hot as the sun and can match the black flames of hell itself. The flames are capable of burning anything, even smothering regular fire, but only harm those that the user wishes to burn or those who hold negative feelings towards the user. For if the flames hit an ally or someone that the user cares for, then they will not burn them, this is because these flames are more control than others' flames. Also like the flames of hell they can also to burn for 7 days and 7 nights and cannot be extinguished with water or any other normal methods, where the user is the only one that can normally extinguish them. They are also extremely effective against demons like myself and other evil spirits, due to them being sacred. But unlike the black flames, which burn slowly, these flames will burn anything that in its path instantly. At this Naruto eyes widened slightly at the power that the flames had, and for a second or two he was ready to instantly agree and take them. 
but before he could he quickly stopped himself, remembering who he was dealing with right now. If these flames are the flames of the heavens as you say, then how can you use them, since you're a demon? Asked Naruto with suspicion. I cannot use them, as you say, since I am a demon, making them worthless to me, but since I'm also a spirit of fire, I can at least summon them and even pass them on to someone like you stated to Kaiubi. At hearing this Naruto became even more suspicion of the Kaiubi, then why are you giving me these flames? Especially since as you said, they can be used to hurt you. It because for the past nine years ever since your wretched father sealed me into you, I have had nothing to do but sit in this cage and watch your worthless life. This of course has been extremely dull and boring, and although I will break free of this seal one day and devour you, I'll need some form of entrainment until then. Hence I've decided to spice things up by giving you these flames and see how you use them, answered the Kaiubi. At hearing this Naruto became angry at hearing how his life was nothing more than entertainment to the demon fox and was about to yell at the demon and tell what he could do with his flames. Author's note. I sure you can image what he would say. But before Naruto could reply to the Kaiubi's offer, the fox spoke again. If you take these flames, then not only can you make your new father proud, but also show all those other fools like the Fire Lord the power you possess, spoke the Kaiubi, playing of Naruto's thrust to prove himself to others and show that he was more than what most people thought he was. And as the Kaiubi suspected when he said this, he saw Naruto staring longingly at the white flame that was in his, the Kaiubi's, paw. The Kaiubi plan was of course to have Naruto use the white flames for destruction, for he had been watching Naruto the past six months and knew of the great war that the Fire Nation was raging. He was also well aware of the destruction and chaos that the Fire Nation was bringing throughout these lands, due to him being also a being of chaos and destruction as well. Hence he wanted some part in on it, which was why giving Naruto these flames was part of it. The Kaiubi of course knew of Naruto's longing for acceptance by those around him, much like the longing he had when he was in Konoha. He also knew that if he gave Naruto these flames, he would eventually use them in the war, whether it was by his own choice. Where he joined the army in the hopes of gaining acceptance in the Fire Nation, by fighting in the war and gaining fame or glory for himself or be forced in the war by the Fire Lord, in the hopes of using the flames to the Fire Nation's advantage. Either of which was fine by the Kaiubi, since his plan was to have Naruto fight in the Fire Nation's war and use the White Flames, which could only be used by those with a good heart and have him cause more chaos and unbalance in the world. This of course would greatly amuse the Kaiubi, since he found the irony of using the Flames of Heaven to cause more chaos and distraction to the world extremely amusing. He also hoped that if Naruto entered this war on the Fire Nation side, then the war would corrupt him and turn Naruto into something much more fitting for a being like himself, Kaiubi. After a few minutes Naruto suddenly spoke up and said I take them. After hearing Naruto answer the Kaiubi smirked and then leaned a bit more forward and took Naruto to take the flame onto both his hands and then pressed them into his chest. Naruto of course did what the Kaiubi said, where as soon as he pressed the white flames into his chest, he suddenly felt the warm heat of the flames spread throughout his body. After which he saw a sort of white glow surround his body like an aura. But the flames are now within you, now you can do firebending and use white fire spoke the Kaiubi, after which he then told Naruto to leave as he was tried, which Naruto was more than happy to do as he had enough of talking to the wretched demon fox as well. And Naruto's mindscape. As Naruto came out of his meditation state, he heard his father voice calling out to him and felt him shaking him, Naruto. Once he fully came of his meditation state and opened his eyes, Naruto found his father Iroh standing in front of him with a worried look and holding his arms shaking him slightly. While his little pet monkey's Io's eye was pinched Naruto cheeks, hoping to waken his master, since like Iroh he was worried about Naruto. Dad spoke Naruto with slight confusion, as he was still slightly disoriented after just coming out of his meditation state. Naruto thank goodness that you alright spoke Iroh with clear relief, I was calling out to you for several minutes, but you were in too deep a trance and didn't reply to me, I was beginning to worry. Hey, hey I'm alright dad, just a little woozy how long was I out? Asked Naruto. About 20 minutes, I would say, I became even more concerned when I saw white glow around your body just a moment ago what happened to you Naruto. At this Naruto side, where he spent the next half hour explaining to his father what had happened. When Naruto explained everything that happened, Iroh had a slight frown upon learning this as he became suspicious at how the Kaiubi gave his adopted son these powerful flames for simple amusement. He was even more concerned at the fact that the Kaiubi was in his son to begin with, as he had read about the demon from one of the books he had gotten when he visited the elemental continent. Hence he knew how powerful the demon was, along with all the destruction and chaos it had caused. As Iroh thought over what he had just learned from Naruto, his adopted son suddenly spoke up with a concerned look due to seeing the frown on his, Iroh, face. You don't think I'm a monster do you dad? Asked a worried Naruto as he was afraid that if his adopted father would hate him just like most of the people in Kanoha did because he had the Kaiubi inside him. 
Upon hearing this Iroh quickly put his hand on Naruto's shoulder and smiled kindly at Naruto, of course not Naruto, only a fool would think that you are a monster, as you're no more a monster than I am, spoke Iroh, whereas Io's eye cried Ika green with Iroh. This of course made Naruto smile, happy at the fact that his father still cared for him, regardless of what lay within him, he even petted Io's eye on the head, thanking his little friend for his support. But we'll have to be more careful now, spoke Iridge seriously, gaining Naruto attention, as there'll be others like those in your former village that'll not understand you and will fear you, as unfortunately, people tend to fear and hate things that they do not understand. Also there'll be those like my brother, who if they found out that a powerful demon like the Kaiubi was sealed within you, then they'll do what your former village tried to do and try and turn you into a living weapon and use the demon's power to finish the war. At hearing this, Naruto nodded in agreement with his adopted father, as he wouldn't put it past his adopted uncle to do such a thing. But first we see if what the Kaiubi did worked and if you can firebend spoke Iroh, where Naruto nodded and took up a basic stance that his father taught him and taking in deep breath just as his father told him to do. After which he then did a fast jab to create a ball of fire, but instead of creating a small fireball, which he intended to do, a giant ball of white fire burst from his fist, which blasted Naruto backwards, due to not expecting the tremendous power from the blast. When Naruto was blasted back from the force of the fireball that he created, Zio's eye quickly cried out in fear and jumped off Naruto and onto the ground, just as he was blasted backwards. At the same time the giant ball of white fire flew toward a large tree that was in front of Naruto, where the ball of fire quickly enveloped the tree, and within less than a minute the tree was reduced to ash, and the white flames continued burning. When Naruto was blasted back by the ball of white fire, Iroh and Zio's eye quickly ran to Naruto, who skidded backwards a bit on the ground before stopping. Once Iroh reached Naruto, he helped his adopted son up, Naruto are you okay? Ow, 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 eh, I think so it just caught me by surprise, said Naruto as he got up, whereas he did Zio's eye quickly jumped onto his master's back and had a concerned look on his little face. Seeing this Naruto just smiled don't worry Zio's eye, I'm fine, after which he petted his little friend on the head again, showing he was fine, making the little monkey smile. After doing this Naruto then looked towards the tree in front of him and saw that it was reduced to ash in space of less than a minute. Eh did I do that? Asked Naruto in surprise as she saw what his flames did. Yes it seems that your white flames are extremely powerful, said Iroh, who was just as surprised at the power of Naruto's white fire, even more so when the flames continued burning, after the tree was burnt to ash. Once Naruto got back up on his feet he and Iroh went over to the still burning white flames and picked them up, where just as the Kaiubi told Naruto the flames did not hurt his adopted father, in fact when he picked them up, Iroh felt the warmth of them flames without being burnt by them. As Iroh looked at the small flame in his hand, he could not help but marvel at the flames as they were beautiful and seemed so pure and perfect and could do no harm, they were unlike any other flames he had ever seen before in his life. Upon seeing the small white flame in Iroh's hand, Zio's eye quickly jumped off Naruto's shoulder and onto Iroh, where he climbed down his arm and went up to the flame, where he brought his small paw up to it, where like with Naruto, it did not burn or hurt him and felt warm. For the next few minutes, Naruto, Iroh and Zio's eye stared in wonder at the white flames, where after the few minutes Iroh the spoke up. These flames of yours are truly a wondrous thing Naruto, I've never seen anything like them before in my many years, and they also seem to be extremely powerful, judging by what just happened. We'll have to train hard for you to be able to control them, as your white fire seemed to make even the most basic fire technique extremely powerful. Naruto of course nodded in understanding, as he knew his adopted father was right, after which Iroh then dropped the white flame he picked up and asked Naruto to see if he could extinguish the white fire. Since from what Kaiubi told Naruto, the flames would continue to burn for seven days and nights, where if they left them then chances were someone would come across them. Where if someone saw white flames burning constantly on the ground without burning themselves out, then it would draw a great deal of attention on Iroh and Naruto, which was something they wanted to avoid, at least for now until they got their stories straight. At first when Naruto tried to extinguish his white flames he had no luck, but after a few minutes and much concentration, he was able to extinguish his flames. Once the flames had been extinguished, Iroh decided that they would call it a day and celebrate Naruto's first successful attempt in firebending, but would keep the news between themselves, at least until Naruto gained better control over his new flames. Iroh also planned to set up up a training regime to allow Naruto to control his new fire better, as after seeing the power of white fire, he knew that if Naruto didn't learn to control them, they could be extremely dangerous to not only Naruto himself, but to others around him. But that would be for tomorrow, since today would be spent celebrating Naruto becoming a firebender, one which Iroh believed would surpass all others even himself. 
but even as he thought this, Iroh was unaware at how true this belief was, since this was the beginning of a new legend that was about to be born, one that would be known throughout not only the four great elemental kingdoms, but also in the shinobi world of the elemental continent, the legend of the White Fire Prince of the Fire Nation. To be continued. I hope you have enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next part.